Good Friday, everyone. Welcome to the VolQuest.com podcast, a mailbag edition with Austin Price, Jesse Simonton, and Rob Lewis. I'm Brent Hubbs. Glad to have you along with us. Plenty of things to get to. Before we get to the questions, I want to ask Jesse, I'll start with you, um, just your thoughts on the Juwan Jennings news from the, the SEC's office that, that he's going to be suspended for a half. You know, I know that Twitter is a bad uh, – there's a lot of bad opinions on Twitter, but I understand why Vol fans were, were upset with the decision because it's impossible to judge intent. The video looks bad, and clearly that's what the SEC went on, uh, you know, stomping on a guy's face. The, the video looks bad, but Jawan never looks down. Um, as, as, you know, we had in the war room, it's strange in terms of precedence, you know, how, how often this has or has not happened uh, with punishment. But... People at Tennessee did not seem surprised that it was coming, and I think that kind of speaks volumes uh, to the fact that maybe they even that they didn't agree with the decision. They they were not caught off guard that Jawan Jennings was going to likely face some sort of punishment. Rob, yeah, I, I mean, I'm just not surprised in, in the current climate, you know, we're, that, that we're in football, both you know NFL and college. I just, I mean, and like Jesse said, I mean, you can't judge intent. Uh, in, the, in the current climate of the world where everybody's guilty until... Well, I mean, just, you know, where they're, they're trying to be... I mean I, I, I mean, I think the powers that be and that, that run the sport at, at, you know, the college and pro level are, are just trying to be proactive in discouraging any more violence than is already in the game. And, and so, you know, based on that, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying I agree agree with it, but I'm, I'm not surprised. Much like Brent said, Tennessee wasn't surprised. Yeah, I don't think, you know, I don't... I think Tennessee knew in their conversations that, that there was a real chance something was coming you know, th- this week on it. I guess my, my big takeaway from it is you, you, got, you got all these people in the stadium supposedly watching all these plays, watching every game. Why, why, not, why not buzz down and say then there's a, there's a flagrant one or there's something there? I mean, you had, you had half of the, uh, the Vanderbilt bench come over, a flag was never thrown. You know, and then the SEC offers up very little explanation on anything. They've not responded to my email. I just emailed them and said, hey, when's the last time a commissioner did this? How many times has this happened over the last five years? Because is it precedent setting, you know, or is this something that happens more frequently than somebody knows that you're invoking this rule? And, of course, the SEC is not going to respond to it because they put that little sentence at the end of their statement yesterday, the matter's closed, we're not discussing it again. And I think that's what hurts the SEC. The, the, the lack of transparency on things, you know, why didn't you get it right? Why didn't you make a call during the game? Okay, and then come back and explain, you know, explain yourself a little better than, than what you've done. Don't just throw the, well, we're never talking about it again. We've made our ruling. I, mean, I think that's, it's, that's a great point. It, well, and it's also, it's also, again, the lack of consistency with, I, it doesn't surprise me that, you know, Things like this are going to happen more with more cameras that are out there. There's more, you know. There's going to be. It's easier to find this footage. But what was it? Week two or week three of the season? Cash Daniel at Kentucky, you know, gets caught on camera twisting. Whether the whether the intent was there or not, again, the video looked bad. It looks like he's trying to hurt a kid. Yes, looked bad. Much like the Juwan Jennings video, just looked bad. But there was no punishment there. And why? What's the disconnect between one versus the other when you're going back? you know, after the fact and, and, and right. handing if down. If you're going through every cut up of every right. game to see if you missed something. Right, and, and then handing down a right. punishment post game. I think that's where some real frustration sets in with Tennessee fans. Yeah, all right, let's get to the, let's get to the questions here. And we'll start with, uh, with Dagley07 here. Are you surprised by any of the recent offers Tennessee's made? Some of these recruits seem to have limited interest from other SEC teams. Do you think these are fallback options that Tennessee's been forced into? Or is Tennessee simply finding some under-the-radar talent that's higher on their board? Specifically, referring to recruits like, I'm going to mess his name up, is it via Cajo? Cajo. Cajo, excuse me. Um, the, the Barden kid, Jimmy Holiday, and the Coleman kid. You want to well, take that one? Barden, I think, is going to stick with Pittsburgh. Um, you know, Callaway, or sorry, Jimmy Holiday is a... Um, That's a guy Tennessee's liked for a while, right? Yeah, Jimmy Holiday has liked him for a long time. Will, I mean, I, Will Friend has specifically been raving about this kid for months. I mean, like, to the point where, like, you know, early in the process, you know, the kid was kind of hidden down there, and Tennessee was not wanting anybody 
anybody to know about him. And, of course, that's impossible in today's recruiting world. But uh, Tennessee loves him a lot, and, and really they've kind of opened their eyes up to the quarterback side of things with Jimmy um, and to the point where you take Jim Chaney down with a full plan on how to use him. Um, you know, uh, you know. I mean, even in a year from now, I, Tennessee could very well, instead of putting Tim Jordan or you know, or in what you know they used this year, Jawan Jennings in that Wildcat, they'd you know likely use Jimmy Holiday, a guy that can throw it and a guy can make plays with his legs. All right, let's go. Let's go, Caho, and let's go, Coleman. Um, Cardi Coleman is a young man that Tennessee likes a lot. They love him off the edge, but um, they, but they just sort of got on him. No, David Johnson. If you go back to this recruiting class. David Johnson's impact is going to be far-reaching, and a lot of it's going to be from him just, you know, continuing to recruit kids. Maybe when Tennessee didn't see them as priorities four or five months ago, he was treating them as they were a priority. And so he kept Corey Coleman warm. He kept the Whitehaven kids warm. Right. He kept, you know, several kids, Jabari Small, warm, um, and always treated them like, you know, that they were, you know, uh, the, the top end guys, and he didn't treat them any other way. And I think that's you know really kind of been a big reason why Tennessee's become such a factor with several of these kids. And then Caho Jesse, um, Tennessee needs a linebacker in this class. You know, he he makes a lot of sense in a lot of in a lot of ways. Uh, to me, it's him or Desmond Tisdall, and Tisdall who's going to commit on the 18th. You know, he, he's not take at Auburn as of now. Maybe that changes between now and the 18th, but as of now, he's not one. Yeah, we'll see where he fits on Tennessee's board too, because the, the numbers are, are shrinking. But in terms of Caho and and him as a prospect, Tennessee believes that because he did not camp anywhere this summer, um, he changed a bit physically, junior to senior season. He's playing much faster on tape, um, so perhaps you know again they got an army of, of guys. You know, in, in the Anderson training facility that, that, that's breaking all this stuff down, they think that he's a guy who has a lot of upside and so maybe some other programs have already been full at that position. Tennessee not can get on a guy uh, that they believe, you know, has, has potential to be an SEC linebacker, much like his brother at Alabama. And here's the one thing you know about this staff, if you've, if you've followed their recruiting since they've been here, they don't stop recruiting. Maybe, you know... It, does it seem odd to be offering kids two weeks before signing day? It's different, but that's that's what they do. I think I think the history says that's what they do. They've done that since they've been here in terms of offering guys. Well, they had to do it that first line. year because it was such a short amount of time. Right, but they did do it last year yeah, as well. Correct, yeah, correct. I mean, they did. All right, let's go to our burger here. Uh, with a small group, small but strong group of seniors departing, which players do you think need to step into strong, performing, leading roles for the 2020 team? Who do you anticipate on next year's team being an all SEC possibility? Leadership, Rob. Uh, man, that's a tough one. When you really start to think about it. I, I mean, this kid's not going to be. <laughs> he's an underclassman, but man, don't you guys think that Henry T is going to be end up being one of the best leaders on this team? Hundred percent. I think he's going to have to be. I mean, I, I mean, that doesn't answer the senior question, but just being around him. I mean, he, he's a guy that just. I mean, he exudes that kind of that kind of personality. He, he one guy that's not got that kind of personality as far as being vocal, but I think will be a much more of a lead by example guy is Emma Gooden. Um, you know, he's an older guy. And uh, and I think he can be in that that realm on the defensive side of the ball next year. I, I do th I do wonder a little bit though, Jesse. And of course, you wonder about this every year. Tennessee's losing productive players, but they're losing strong personalities. Everybody on this defense will tell you this is Daniel Batuli's defense. Okay, he's the he's the straw that stirs the drink. Whatever you know phrase you want to use. And that Nigel Warrior is the one guy on the team, offensively and defensively, that's not afraid to get in somebody's face. Right, and then Jawan Jennings on the other side just breeds the competitiveness. So they are losing three. I mean, that's very vocal, very loud locker room guys. That's a really good question. I mean, I'm sitting here thinking about it. Not, I can't. Just, there's not a junior that pops in my head. Well, and worse, like, that's, well, that's, the, that's the guy. Yeah, and worse is that, you know, it's not official, but the likelihood is that Trey Smith, right. who uh, could uh, assume that role, is I not had, is not coming. I was is, counting on him not being here. Yeah, is, and that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. It, but, or else he would have that role. Right, but Brandon I think. Brandon Kennedy's a quieter guy. Um, I mean, it's going to be, you know, some under. It's, you know, I, I don't really think Bryce Thompson has that sort of personality, although I think he's going to be one of the better players, you know, on the team next season. So that, that's going to be – that will be a storyline that gets a lot of headway in the spring because, you know, it was so much when Pruitt first got here that 
the coaches were the leaders. He changed tune on that last season, mid-season, where it was like, hey, there needs to be some accountability with the players. He then credited them you know, with that Kentucky win about how they were ready to lift up. Obviously, that's been a big deal with this turnaround and the buy-in from this senior class. I think that's going to be – that's a great question and an interesting storyline to follow and, next and fall. I, and I think Jared wants to be the guy, but he's got to play consistently – in order to become that guy. Because as you talked about, in, in when he was struggling, he still had no problem giving the rah-rah speech and all those things. I think he really wants that role. but from, and, and he's got more credibility to give it right now because of his toughness that he's shown down the stretch of this season. But still, I think he's got to prove, he's got to go out and play consistently week in and week out at a high level in order for his words to resonate throughout the locker room consistently. I agree. Because uh, when you look along the offensive line, I, I think Wanye can eventually get there. Um, he's not a huge dominant personality, but more so he's more of a dominant personality than Darnell. Brandon Kennedy's not got a dominant personality. And, you know, right. he, he would get a sixth year. None of the guards. Um, and really none of the receivers. I know the one guy that I tell you who's not been in the program very long, but I, I, he always kind of had a dominant personality in, in, in recruiting was D'Angelo Gibbs. So how comfortable does he feel stepping into a role such as that? And as far as Trey, well, we never even seen him play well. I mean, I know there's a there's a ton of buzz about him, but he had, I mean, I mean, nah, yeah, look, that's a big a, ask. That's a big ask for a kid. But, but you have a great spring, possibly. Yeah. You know, because he 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 is loud. He he does have, he is vocal. Yeah, and so I'll say this about Trey. I, I know everybody's got him going pro. I lean to him going pro, but I don't think it's the slam dunk that everybody else has. It is. You know, I, I think that there's there's a scenario where he does come back. Well, the I staff would, certainly hopes he does. Well, they're certainly re- <laughs> they're certainly recruiting him to yes, come back. Yes, exactly. No I mean, he's that. he's one but of their biggest recruits right now. I think the question he Trey has to recruit. I think the Trey the question Trey has to look at before we get back to the mailbag stuff here is Trey has to look at how much can I improve if I come back? Where does the NFL project me now? Okay, and how realistic is it with? the medical condition that's going to be flagged to me, and I know the Chargers guy is doing it, but it's always going to be flagged on him. Can he really, how much can he improve his stock rank draft-wise from where he's at right now to the end of next year? My month? counter, my, my, my counter, I agree with that. My counter, if I'm talking to Trey Smith as someone just looking at this from not, not with a side for one or the other, you're risking your life playing this game to begin with. I'd, I'd want to get paid for the, oh, for the, the right. rest of my snaps but I'm in my saying, life. I'm saying this. I, I, would, I think he's gone, and I think that's where he'll end up. I mean, the scenario that I think if you're Tennessee, you're trying to paint. You're not, you're not painting loyalty to the orange. You're painting, hey, you can come back and make a lot more money. Is that realistic? I don't know the answer to that. That's I, the NFL's I, I, I just, side. I think he's going to have huge medical question marks even if he comes back. And I'm, I'm, Just like Jesse said, I think – any football he plays after this year, I think he's going to get paid for. I think the biggest thing, and I had somebody tell me this earlier this week, and I think it's, it rings very true, is Trey's probably never going to be a first-round pick. I know what Cole Kubelik's saying, you know, but because of the medical stuff, probably never going to be a first-round pick. But he's never going to be a no pick either. So, like, he's going to be in that middle round range no matter what happens. You know, right. I do think, though, it, devil's advocate, if he had two straight years of never having an episode – and had mastered the plan on how to attack it, there's that chance for him to potentially raise up the draft boards. I think this year, though, you're, you're looking at you know middle, middle rounds. Yeah, well, I mean, I think if he's a third-round pick this year, he's getting a four-year deal. Okay, if he's a third-round, you know, a higher third-round pick next year or a late second-round pick next year, he's probably still getting a four-year deal. So when do you want to start that clock? Right. I think it goes back to the point and, you're making. And it's all – and you get to that second contract. Right. Where, you, you where the real money years, is. Then you get to the second contract. Play. So, so those are things that he has to look at. Here's what we know about Trey. He does enjoy being here. He does enjoy the college game. He will look at it thoroughly. He will not make, as as he did with his medical situation, he will not make just a ra- just an irrational decision. He'll go all the way through it 100%. I'll, I'll say this. You know, you've lost Ryan Johnson this week. You lost Marcus Tatum. Those guys weren't huge contributors for you anyway. They were just more warm bodies in case you, you did lose somebody on the field. The fact that Tennessee has had to have so many different combinations this year and in, in, in piece, piecing it all together on the offensive line, it, it should give you a better feeling, even if you lose Trey, which would be a huge loss, 
that you know Carbon has stepped in and been really good the last you know four or five weeks. You know Darnell and Wanya, what are they going to be like year two in the program after being you know around? You know Darnell's never been through a, a off season weight conditioning. Well, you got you got some foundation pieces yeah. to build on, no question. Calvert about that. can play guard. Yeah, I mean, he's a guy. Ron, yeah, I mean, he's a guy you didn't know if he could play at now, all. Or nobody stay on this nobody on this podcast is saying, hey, it's okay to lose track. <laughs> yeah. You know because you're not replace. None of those guys are where he's at in terms of talent level. Our performance, but to your points, right? Because you played so much depth, you're not going to go through with looking at four guards who've never played meaningful snaps. You're in a lot better spot than job. if you'd have lost him for this year. Yes, absolutely, a much better spot. All right, let's get to CD Vol. We get rolling here. How many receivers do you see Tennessee taking? Seems like Tennessee will be low on numbers next year at the receiver position. Also, has the staff visited Mordecai McDaniel yet? Uh, reading that Florida's still sniffing around there. Let's go with receivers. How many more are they going to take? Does anybody know? I mean, because the numbers. When the numbers are so like fluid. I mean, Tennessee's. You know, I, like I said, I think you know, the, the Barden kid's going to end up sticking with Pitt. Ramon Henderson's going to come in here, but I, I think that's a tough pull. So um, they may be done at receiver. They may be done at receiver. Uh, again, I do think you know the D'Angelo Gibbs thing gives you a little bit of wiggle room, just because they're you know. recruiting the Wren kid that just decommitted from Georgia. He's visiting next week. Yeah, is that the kid? Is that the the kid little, from Louisiana? Yeah, yeah the little, little speedster, the little tiny speedster. speedster. As for Mordecai McDaniel, Tennessee was was with him on Thursday. Okay. Um, you know, uh, you know that one was you know. Tennessee and Florida. It's a it, it, it's it's that one's gonna be a battle. You know, well, I, we always I, knew it would be. Yeah, I think we all knew it would be. I mean, here's the thing: Tennessee's pitch is gonna be Florida's got seven DBs committed in this class. You know, you gonna be number eight. Right. You know, I mean, they took four a year ago, and you know they're relatively still young at that position because even a guy like Trey Dean is a true sophomore this year. You know, we'll be back around, and I mean, I don't know if he's done enough to warrant being going pro after his third year. So, I mean. You know, Florida's very heavy at the defensive back spot. All right. DD Vol 81, if there are any staff changes for Tennessee, when do you see them taking place? Probably. I don't see anything happening until January. I don't. Uh, maybe, it, maybe February. May, or later. Maybe, maybe after. If, <laughs> and, and I don't know that it's a given. I know we've talked about it earlier in the year. Th that thing changes all the time. I, I don't know. Look, you're going to have to make some decision on three guys whose contract expires. So that opens up certainly that possibility for. for um, change there. We'll see if they elect to renew some contracts on a one-year deal or if they elect to make some changes there. The safe bet is that there will be at least a change mm -hmm. only because the that's just the way the movement works. Whether that's whether that's somebody not getting renewed or get somebody like Chris Rump that gets another job yeah. with yeah. one year left. Because his buyout, Kevin Chair's buyout, Chris Rump's buyout significantly lower now with only one year left than one two years well you got look you got a lot of changes going on in this league you got changes going on at sure. florida state you got a lot of movement and we haven't even those guys don't have head coaches so you haven't even started those moving parts bouncing around everywhere and there. do they get the same kind of deals like the multi-year deals I mean, right i mean that was a heavy investment when, when jeremy first got here i mean do, yeah. do you do that again with the guys that are running out right all right inordinate vol what uh vols have had the biggest dis Disparity between talent and legendary status. I thought of this question because of Juwan, Jan uh, Juwan Jennings, who's obviously talented, but not sure he would come close to cracking the top 25 and the most physically gifted players in school history, but is certainly a top 25 in legendary status. Also think of a guy like Dane Bradshaw in basketball. Would love to hear your take on this. Uh, guys who were legends that maybe weren't the most talented guys. Legend's such a hard word. You know, I mean, I, I think I think Casey Clawson comes to mind. Probably not the most talented quarterback to ever play at Tennessee, but the tough, tough, gritty, tough warm, road warm, warrior knew how to knew how, knew how to manage his talent where he didn't put himself in, in bad spots. I, I think you got to put him on, on that yeah, category. I would totally agree with that. I mean, I, I think that one jumps out to me. I think Juwan Jennings. Wayne Chisholm, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> I think Juwan. Wayne I think Juwan Jennings' talent's pretty good. I mean, he wasn't healthy all the time. I mean, he's just not a burner. He's That's just not a burner. But I think his, I think his, Juwan I mean, Smith. He's not, he's not the most talented guy. All right, um, Bassmaster Vol is Fillinger a priority for the Vols? Is that how you say his name? The Texas kid. Yeah, yeah, I, or the Texas commit, former Texas commit. He's he's one we had it in the war room. You know, he, he's 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 one of those names. There's about four or five names that, depending on what happens in December. Tennessee, for Tennessee fans to keep an eye on in January. He's not doing anything anytime soon. Utah kid, Tennessee obviously went by and saw him this week. Uh, you know, wait and see on that one. Is um, is Jones Bell going to visit, or is that thing is that ship sailed? 
Uh, I think that ship has sailed. I don't think he's going to visit. All right. Tennessee going to hold on to Callaway? Yes. Not going to visit Auburn, which is a good sign for Tennessee. That's correct. He goes to Kentucky this weekend? Yes. yes. And we've all believed that's been Tennessee's biggest challenge, right? Yeah. Our biggest concern. Yeah. But right now you think Tennessee's got mm -hmm. low there. Agreed? Yep. Um, <laughs> Be warned 14. When is Tosh LePoy slated to join the staff? I don't think that one. I don't Ain't think happening. That's I, I think do, I think Tosh Lupoi has got to wait at least another year before he can come back to the league. <laughs> so I think there's a chance he remains in Cleveland unless they clean house in Cleveland. Um, Tennessee loses a ton of production on offense and defense after the season. Who are some of the early names to watch to fill the needs at receiver, middle linebacker, rush in, and on the offensive line? What do you think the realistic expectations for the team should be next year, considering all those unknowns? Well, listen. I, I think I think. Every year you're going to have unknowns, okay? Now, maybe a team like LSU, they have one major unknown next year. But they're going to have some other spots to fill. But everybody knows it's, it's Joe Burrow. That they, but everybody has questions well, look at going Tennessee's in. Tennessee's defensive line was an unknown. And look at the last I mean, five or six at, weeks. I'm just going to say, I, mean, I think the expectations should be – I mean, I think that they'll get – I think expect should, them to get better next year. I think it should be eight and four. At minimum, I agree. And you're, you're losing – I mean, as we all – assuming Trey leaves, you're losing one starter – from both sides of the line of scratch. That's, you know, That's pretty strong. Oklahoma. The you're bringing good and back. Yeah. If, 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 if the knee rehab goes Oklahoma, well. the three big ones in the league. If you can – I mean, again, you're asking them to run the table outside of that. But, I mean, it, it, it can be done. The league shouldn't be drastically better at the quarterback spot in any, in any they, way. They are going to need uh, a, a sizable leap. I, I agree with AP. But, but I do think they're going to need – much like they got some contributions this year from some freshmen, Jalen Hyatt's going to need to be ready to play. Uh, somebody else is going to have to emerge at receiver, whether it is Gibbs, who's never played there, but has obviously been. Or Brandon Johnson has to take a big leap. Like, like a huge Keaton. leap. I like Keaton. Right. Keaton's got to get bigger. I think I think there's a greater chance that what Rob just said happens versus Brandon. I mean, I think you spring Brandon Johnson has got his floor because he's a veteran is higher, but his ceiling caps out in my opinion. Lead receiver on this team a couple of years ago. Okay. Well, I'm just saying. I mean, I mean, I'm just saying the guy, the yeah, guys had that, some production. That was production. the year that Dormady couldn't complete a pass, and JG couldn't complete a pass either. I'm well, here's the thing. But, but, but here's the thing. I do. I mean, he, be, he better accept. be able. He better be productive for Tennessee. Yeah, is what I'm, I, I'm with. I'm with. I'm with Hubs on that, and I think Rob's right. I mean, Keaton's a guy, but some of these guys are, are going to have to take big leaps because when you're losing the playmaking ability of Jawan and Callaway, and then you basically add the fact that Tennessee is going to return the same stable of running backs that are just kind of like shoulder shrug. Like one week in, one week out, we, what we saw Eric Gray do in the finale was fantastic, but that was a one-game blip. Ty was just, you know, pretty good. Tim Jordan, solid. They don't have, they don't have some of the, you know, you know, just explosiveness that some of these other teams have. So they're leaning on the receivers. I guess, right, well, look, I, I guess my point was the leap part of that. I just don't think Brandon Jones – I think Brandon Jones can take a step. Well, I, I'm not saying a 1,000 yards next year. I, I don't mean that. But that's a guy who has to be productive for Tennessee. I mean, he, he, has, he has to be a productive guy. Can he get you 40 to 50 yards a game? I mean, that, I think that's a solid – I think that's, no, that's a really good year yeah, for him. No, yeah, I mean, if he could, if he could get there. To, let me ask it this way, to, to piggyback off his question a little bit. We had, we had touched a little bit on the offensive line. Uh, I think middle linebacker, I think, I think Crouch is going to go back inside. I think it may be Crouch and, and Henry T as your two inside linebackers next year. We'll see. We'll see where J.J. Peterson say, is. What are you doing your J.J. Peterson stock? But, but I, just, I, I think there's a chance that it's Crouch as the inside guy next to Henry T next year. If that's the case, to me, you circle back around to what may be the biggest question mark on this team next year, and that's your outside edge guys. Who are they? Does Roman Harris, Roman Harris take a You're talking about a leap. Now, that's a leap. Yeah, he's going to have to have a leap, yeah. You know, they'd, like him for, they'd, they'd like for him to grow an inch or two. Too. Right. You know, but I mean. <laughs> Hagel pull him in there and put him in that stretching machine like Barney did on the Andy Griffin show. You know, but you got, I mean, Kevon Bennett's been solid this year. He's been it's, good. He's exceeded expectations. But he, he's not going to be a seven eight sack guy. But I don't think so. So we're, to me, when you look at all the question marks, I look at rush in and, and circle that one and say that may be bigger than receiver that that this team has, and it, it's probably bigger than inside linebacker for this team next year. That's my opinion. I agree. I agree. Because I mean, I, I mean, is DeAndre Johnson going to suddenly turn it on? No, I mean, he's not. Every time he makes a play, he gets yanked out of the game and, and yelled at for whatever you know for doing something. So. I just don't know that it's going to be there for him 
Um, so and depending on how this class fills out, I don't think there's an obvious guy to come in and even play situation. But it has to be because you just don't have enough warm. You don't have enough warm bodies. I'm, but but I'm saying in terms of being ready. I, yeah, that's where which is why the hit of losing BJ that's and why they're saying, they're, they're going so hard trying to flip Ojolari back. Right. Um, is Tennessee looking to add one more O lineman? Uh, I know you said the board is fluid. You care to dive deeper into that. It seems we want a linebacker, two or three more defensive linemen for sure. I, I, I could see them adding another offensive lineman. They just in this class. offered the kid from St. Louis, didn't they? Who are they going the to go with? Commit, yeah, the, the they would, but their, their preference, though, would be to not. I mean, I think they offered him just to offer him. I think their preference would be to find a tackle, and he's a guard. But who's the tackle? Who's the tackle name? Who's the tackle name or two out there? You got anybody to keep an eye to even even chase down as a tackle body? I don't think they're going to take Chris Morris in this class, but I am not willing to say they won't because I've seen that that recruitment twist and turn and twist and turn. And well, two weeks ago, I'm unwilling to close the door. I think the door the door is, is is somewhat shut. Right. But I'm unwilling to close it and lock it. Yeah, I just I mean I think if they take one, it would have to be perhaps him. I just don't see another. I don't see them going and visiting other names. You know, kind of random guys out there. I mean, no, they really want to hold on to Kyrie Miller, and it's obviously by his tweet, he has a great affection for Jim Chaney. They think they've got a real fine there, right? And I think they they, they feel solid about where they are with that right now. James Robinson told you he's not I'll visiting, visiting Mississippi else, State. Not visiting yeah. Mississippi State. You know how it goes though. This time of year, hubs kids say a lot of things. So That's I mean, true. like I'll be watching this weekend to see if he goes or not. I mean, and then they love Spragans. So I mean. Seven hundred forty-nine percent. Seven forty-six. Seven forty-six. Is it dropped? I'll say what. See what you mean. That kid's 30%. never wavered, though. No, he's I mean, not. And and you know when he committed, everybody's like, wait a minute, he commits on the spot, total emotional type deal. That, that thing, there's you know that's going to get wild home. and wooly, and it's not. He's Tennessee's been rock steady through that the whole thing with it him. Had, I mean, I've actually been surprised that he hadn't kind of gained a little bit more traction elsewhere in terms of just offers. But, yeah, that, that, that's one Tennessee deserves credit for finding and then holding on to. All right. Um, I know the staff's been focused on closing out uh, the 2020 class. Any recruits seem to have a lot of traction with in 2021. I think that's going to be – I think that's what January is all about. Don't you, Austin? 2021? 100%. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I think, think some of that's you know, been you know, this week, depending on where guys were. You know, I mean, you know, I, I know that, you know, you know, Kevin Sherr spent a good portion of Thursday seeing 2021s, you know, um, down in Georgia. I mean, I, I just depend, I mean, like, after. And when they were in Nashville and Memphis. Yeah. Seeing guys like Turrentine and some of those other guys. That yeah. Breed Love and those guys. Also, I uh, wanted to know post rankings release, any new rankings surprise you? Biggest surprise to me was the fall of Bryson Eason. Yeah, I really don't understand that one. Um, I, how he's 50 spots below his teammate Martavis French, I'll never understand that. But, I mean, I don't understand a lot of things. I don't understand how Reggie Grimes is 40 spots ahead of B.J. Ojolari. And B.J., I mean, and he's not coming here. He's going to LSU. So, it's not like I'm right. got some orange-tinted glasses on. <laughs> I just think B.J.'s a way better player than Reggie Grimes. And how Reggie Grimes remains the number one player in the state still baffles me. When, when you're not a take – for anybody in the league except for South Carolina, who is, was basically on a borderline coaching change at, at one point late in the year, and uh, Vanderbilt, how can you know? And you live in the heart of the SEC. How can you be the number one player in the state? That, that's my opinion. All right, I don't disagree with you there. I, 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 those are the ones that jumped out to me. All right, hard hat vol. Will there be any more transfer portal players before the bowl game? And do you think any of the current ones in the portal change their minds could opt to stay? I don't see Tatum stay, coming back. I don't see Ryan Johnson coming back. I don't see Means coming back. Do you? They'll no, try. I don't even think they're going to try with Means. I, I thought they would. He seemed to me like the most logical one that they would try to. They were surprised by Ryan Johnson. Not surprised by Marcus Tatum. They'd known he was leaving for a while. You know, he, but he was going to get through the season and uh, was, a, was a good teammate. You're going to see some guys leave after the bowl game. Right. I'm not, not sure anybody else before. Not before, I don't think. But I, think I don't really understand the why game. these guys were leaving before the bowl game. You didn't go get a bowl gift? <laughs> like you go through the guts and, and, and the heart and, you know, all that, that those, those tough practices, and, and then you get a chance to cash in, you don't? Yeah. Makes no sense to me. All right. Is Tennessee a legitimate threat for Stackhouse? Uh, I mean, we had it in the war room. He's another guy to keep an eye on in January. But I think it's an uphill battle. I would agree there. All right, Rob, let's go to hoops here. Now that you've seen several weeks of underwhelming 
uh, college basketball, SEC and nationally. What would, what would you now project Tennessee's conference record and position in final standings to be? Also, NCAA tournament seeding. Go ahead, I mean, predict I, your April. I mean, I, <laughs> or March. I, I picked me. them fourth on my SEC pre, on my you know one of, one of the voters in the SEC preseason stuff. I picked them fourth. I don't really. I mean, I, I still they 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 could maybe finish a spot higher than that, but that's kind of where I sit. I mean, I, I'm not I'm not backed off that, and I thought all along they'd be you know somewhere in. In between a four and a six seed in the, in the tournament, and I've not seen anything to change my mind. I mean, they could, you know, they might end up finishing ahead of either Auburn or, or Florida, Florida if they really kind of fall apart. But I mean, I still, I, I say Kentucky, Florida, Auburn, or Kentucky, I think will win it. I mean, I think they'll get their act together and look a lot better. Tennessee could could sneak ahead of, of Florida or or Auburn, but I. Auburn is more likely. I could see them finishing third. If they, if they finish higher than third, I think that would be remarkable. All right. Um, do you think that successful teams are going to have to take advantage of the transfer portal? Malik Jackson, Aubrey Solomon were two very good transfers or are very good transfers for Tennessee. Also two teams in the playoff, Ohio State and LSU, have quarterbacks that transfer to their schools. Uh, is the transfer portal going to be a fundamental fixture for elite teams? I 100% think so. 100%. Yeah. I I mean, I think so with as many kids that are transferring. And as, and as many kids are, are getting immediately eligible. I mean, obviously, Tennessee fans have a sour taste in their mouth about, you know, on the basketball side. But, I mean, it used to be, I mean, golly. I mean, it, was, it just didn't it, happen. It was rare. Right. I mean, really, you know, mom had to be on, on you know, in the hospital or something. And right. Now yeah. it's just, you know, Justin Fields gets mad at Georgia and is immediately, you know, has a chance to win and, a and national I, championship. Because there's – 400 cases that still haven't been resolved by the NCAA on transfers. I do think we're coming down the pike a time in which everybody's going to get one mulligan. I, I, I they're going to give one, they're going to give them one unconditional transfer, which is going to be wild wild west. Uh, but I think that day's coming. I, I don't agree. know I mean, that it, I don't know that it's coming in the next two years. But I think as this thing develops moving forward, I think and, I, mean, I, and I think they should. I mean, you know, fans at schools never were going to get mad. But I mean, they're college kids, I mean, so you. you don't like the decision you made, why should that impact you know, two years of your life when you're 19 years old? All right. Uh, will Tennessee circle back on the Abrams drain kid? I haven't heard that name in a while. Now that Ole Miss is in football hell, no, no. I don't see that happening. And is, they didn't take him to begin with. Um, any chance uh, – what's Tennessee's chances with B.J. if LSU takes the Webb kid? I, I'm not sure those two are mutually inclusive to each other. I don't, I don't think if the Webb kid goes to LSU – that means LSU doesn't have room for BJ or doesn't push for BJ to you? No, I don't believe so. Okay. AP, give me your picks for the high school state championship games this weekend. Uh, give me Greenback in 1A, Meigs County in 2A, 3A I take uh, Coa, Elizabeth in 4A, 5A, I'm going to give me Summit in the upset over Central, and then 6A, um, give me Maryville. I mean, they, they shut out uh, Oakland last week. If they do that, they shut out Ravenwood. All right. All of all, 850, just how certain were you that, guys that there was going to be another head coaching search happen for Tennessee after the Florida game? Be honest. Never thought that Jeremy Pruitt was going to be in trouble after the Florida game. Uh, wasn't going to make a change there. I mean, if they went 1-11, okay. But, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I didn't see them going 7-5 and five the way they went 7-5, and five, but I didn't walk out of games with Florida going, man, we're going to have another, you know, hellacious December with a coaching change. Did anybody think that that was going to no. be the case? No, no. I, I thought walking out of Florida that if the season didn't get turned around, Jeremy was going to enter a prove it year next season. Right. I think we all I, I certainly felt that way. Um, da, 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 da. For Je Jesse, what's your predictions for the final 2020 recruiting rankings? Who asked for that? For Tennessee, this is JWV one one two one seven five. I've 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 stuck that I think that you know if if they. Can clean house. They can maybe get as high as like nine, ten, but I think they're likely going to finish somewhere around fifteen. And, and and to me, the key in all this is not necessarily where you're ranked. I mean, obviously, you want to be ranked top five. Teams that are in the top five are playing in the playoffs. But if you can't do that, you've got to be able to do what you did this past year, which is hit on enough guys that can help you early. I mean, if you go back to this class, I mean, there's enough guys that have played, uh, you know, tangible football this year. To make you feel like that class is going to pan out to be pretty good in that 2019 year. All right, Matt, I has two questions here. 
Uh, would Tennessee advise a commitment to look elsewhere at this point, or is that a no-no with two weeks to go in signing, and signing day? Is that too late? It's and not it's, a no-no. <laughs> and is Perry for sure a take on the 18th? Uh, as of now, I would say yes. But, I mean, again, if you if you hit on all these guys and maybe, you know, we get back and play with one or two more, then possibly no. Uh, shout out to iHeart Vols. After that hit Saturday, any chance Pruitt lets Juwan set in on linebackers meetings for just for old times' sake? <laughs> at, that one wins the day, right? I mean, that, that, come on, that, that that's a pretty good post, right? That's, that's, a, that's a deep pull. He's so competitive. <laughs> he's been setting in on linebacker meetings. I mean, I that's. I mean, he's, I mean, I mean, Butch told some whoppers. That one was as big as any. That Except for the falling on the helmet thing. That, yeah, that, he that's number one. Yeah, I, yeah but that whopper that. The whopper when he told Hubs the sideline thing, we're sitting there at practice. He, he, Butch was gone two and a half weeks later. I mean, it, that was why he would even feel the need to say something like that. Because in remains. Butch's mind, he, he thought he was going to be able to save it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> of course, all coaches think that. All right. Leo's buddy is the staff down on Maurer. Looks like a lot of potential there. It could be argued he jumped. Jump started the season with his energy. Seemed like they were more willing to let JG make mistakes and stay in than let Maurer make mistakes and learn, even with Maurer appearing to have more upside. I, I, again, I, I think Ryan Maurer is a good player. I mean, actually, I don't think I've ever given this opinion. This has been my opinion for a while. Jesse knows this. I've just, you, again, you, you, you pick your points to say things. I think Ryan Maurer is a good, solid player. But I think so much of the fan base just fell in love with him running down the vol walk and him throwing a bomb against Georgia. You know, four, four interceptions in, in his first 55 passes. Yeah, I mean, like, he, if he had to come in, he could win you a game. There's no doubt. But on a, on a you know, game in, game out basis, Jarrett still gives you the best opportunity to, opportunity to win. He's older. He doesn't make the minimum mistake. And that's the thing. What you and I see and what the fan sees are two different things than what the coaches see as far as what your read was on that play, what was the protection supposed to be on that play. I mean – Check it out of a yeah. bad run. I mean, I, you know, again, I can sit there and watch football and go, well, that was a terrible play. But in reality, it was the right play. They just, you know, one guy messed up. And, I, and you know, again, I, I just think that. Well, I'll give, you a great, I'll give you a great example. In the Kentucky game, Tennessee has the ball at midfield. They run for nine yards on first down, okay, or, or eight yards on first down. It's the best run of the day, right? To that point, yeah. To that point. Cheney comes out, and they throw a pass on second and two. That's incomplete. They throw a pass on third and two that's incomplete. And everybody's going, what the hell is Jim Chaney doing? Run the football. You just got eight yards. The reality was both of those were RPO calls. The first one was a bad read by Maurer, who should have kept the ball. The second one, he threw a stick route to the right, and the guy was wide open to the left. It was a bad read. It's why Jeremy Pruitt went to the locker room and said uh, to Casey on the Vol Network, we're making a quarterback change because we need somebody to move the ball down the field. You're like, wait a minute, Brian's numbers aren't that terrible. It's to your point. Sometimes what we see, yep. we just don't we don't understand everything that that so, And look, there were times that Jared yeah, go back made to the, mistakes. You go back the to same the same way. Go back to the was it Chattanooga game? What was the first game? What was the first George, win of the year? Oh, Chattanooga. Yeah, Chattanooga. First play, he throws that deep ball. His only incompletion he had all day was a deep ball incompletion to, to Callaway. Callaway was supposed to be a decoy on that play. The route was supposed to go to Jawan Jennings. And it was a scripted play, and Jarrett still came out and threw to the wrong guy. So I mean, like they both make mistakes. Don't sure. I'm not I'm not sitting here just, you know, poo pooing on Brian Mauer. I think Brian Mauer's going to be a good player. I, I would just wouldn't say the staff's down on him. I right. just think they feel more comfortable with Jarrett. And Jarrett, after the Alabama game, minimized his mistakes more than than Mauer was minimizing his mistakes, which is well, why they tend to see the best and, chance. And, and, which is like you go back to you know. I love you know everybody knows how to do stuff with Mark Packer and Mark Mark is in love with Harrison Bailey. He thinks Mark Harrison Bailey is 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 John Elway and he may be, but that's a lot of pressure on a kid. So I mean like my point is a lot of fans are doing the same thing and it's easy when you're a fan. You want you I dude, I remember when I was in college and I, I went here and you fell in love with the shiny objects when you're when you're when you're a fan of a school. Well, and everybody loves the backup quarterback at every yeah. school in the country. Or the young, or the young. Except high, at LSU, they don't like the backup quarterback at LSU because they have no idea who it is. Or the, or the young, highly ranked recruit that's sure. you know, standing on the bench. Yeah. All right, wrapping it up here with this question. Uh, this is from Rocky Top Thirty. What are your thoughts on the coaching carousel? Who do you think ends up at Florida State, Ole Miss, Missouri, and Arkansas? And how will this year's coaching carousel affect Tennessee's future staff and recruiting? Let's just start with the first question. 
We think Lane Kiffin's going to get a job? I was going to say, if Lane Kiffin goes to Ole Miss, that will affect Tennessee's recruiting in Memphis big time. Big do you, time. Do you think Lane gets the Ole Miss job? It seems to be trending that way as we as – we, I mean, Jimmy Sexton is sitting there in Memphis, and he's got a lot of ties to, to Oxford. I'd say, I mean, he can make it – I think he – it feels like he's going to make that happen. I think, yeah, it may be. I, I, I think Jimmy Sexton is pulling the old puppet strings on, on about three of these job searches right now. So – we think Kiffin's going to get Ole Miss or Arkansas. Now, it feels that way, right? Yeah. One of the two. It's hard to see him being back at, at FAU at this point. I mean, either one of those, he affects Tennessee's recruiting in Memphis, but especially if he's, you know, 45 minutes down the road in Oxford. Yeah. I, no, no. I don't know that it affects it right now. No, no, but no, no. But forward, certainly. In the years to come. Not this year, but uh, in the years to come. What's Missouri going to do? Jesse, are they really, are really, are they really going to go Michael Wayne? No, I think he turned it down. I mean, that was the rumor that came out Thursday that he said no because I don't think they can pay enough. Which may fall back to Will Healy at Charlotte. I, it, and he took his name out of the running, too, I think. So he's out it's, of that I one. Mean, it's, I it's, think they could end up getting a guy like Willie Fritz. What's, what's going on with that search just highlights how bad of a job that is. In this well, league. and I think it also tells you they don't have any money. Because, I mean, you know, you're talking about they're probably not going to pay $3 million. Which, in this day and age, what kind of, what kind of, and Butch what kind is of market like, are you in? I mean, if you can't even enclose your stadium and you play in the SEC, come but, on. And Butch is like, I'll do it for $1 million. <laughs> it's going to be a crazy Sunday, though. That is what what's going to happen. I'll be because close the end of that stadium, brick by brick. <laughs> what what it's going to be a crazy Sunday because all these these Norvell, who's probably going to get the Florida State job because they're not getting that what's coming Sunday night, Monday morning, right? Right, and and that's because they they just you know Brian Kelly and Franklin and those guys just don't have any interest, and that's an administration deal. No right. one wants to, to to go with where the president and AD may be out in six months. But Kiffin's playing in the championship game. Billy Napier depends on how some of this stuff falls out. I mentioned his name on Monday. I mean, he's, he is getting linked to Ole Miss and Arkansas because I think it's the natural jump for him. Again, has ties to Dabo and Nick. He's playing in a championship game. McElwain's playing in a championship game. So a lot of this stuff I think is going to come out, you know, midday Sunday and then how quickly the dominoes fall depending on – where someone lands. Because Ole Miss, I actually think their number one target is Norvell. But Norvell just has a better option. I mean, yeah. Norvell, you're going to take Florida. You're going to take easier Florida, option. Florida State is, yeah. is, is, a, is... A way easier job. It's also a better job yeah. than Ole Miss. Yeah. And you don't have to, uh, unless, unless your administration's so messed up, it makes it a hard job in terms of, in terms of academics, in terms of funding. And, and some of those things. Now, is yeah, there, but I, but at least at least there, you, if it, you can buy a house if you're going to Tallahassee, they're not going to fire you after two years because of what they just did to Willie. You're renting if you're going if you're taking the job yeah. at Ole Miss or Arkansas it, I mean, because there's a good chance you're not going to be there in four years anyway. There's one but there's one program that's that's better than you in, in the ACC. And there's four better. There's four yeah. in division. Well, division. Well, <laughs> it's an easier job, which thus makes it a better job, and and it does have some stability because you're right. They can't have another change two years from now. Um, but Ole Miss has got a first-time AD who clearly didn't have a plan, thus firing Matt Luke while he just left somebody's house on a recruiting trail. Didn't even call him into the office to tell him he was fired. Eee, that's a red flag if I'm a coaching candidate in terms of how that one was handled. Florida State's got its warts as well, you know. Um, but it is, to me, it's an easier path to success at Florida State than it is at Ole Miss for a variety of reasons. Um, I, I don't think there's, to me, there's not any question about that. Let me ask you, is my, where's Mike Bobo going to land? Is he going to be is he going to be South Carolina's OC, or is Kirby Smart going to make some kind of interesting move on his staff? I have no idea. It, it, I, the South Carolina stuff seems like if that's going to happen, that's that would probably need to happen fairly soon. I would think so, unless unless Bobo thinks that maybe there's a chance. Something does happen with Georgia, where he's pretty good friends with Kirby Smart. Is he going to hold out? Well, they are legitimately like best friends. Did they play together? Yeah, and they were captains at the same time. And they, I mean, there's been many a story written about how close those two guys are. Uh, Go back there as the OC or, or quarterbacks coach or what? But I mean, if the, if they do something Clo- closer than, yeah. da- than than David Green and um, and Pollock and Pollock, what I, do you think? I don't know. Something, but the, the thing that's interesting would be would be does Bobo go to South Carolina because you're talking about the Georgia ties there. McClendon got demoted, but is McClendon, if McClendon stays, that would be 
probably easier for McClendon to swallow working under a guy he worked under at Georgia multiple times versus somebody else that comes in there. Right. If you're if you're going conspiracy theory, you know, and probably easier for deal. McClendon to handle that than Cooley to handle that at Georgia if he were to get demoted in some way after one year as the offensive coordinator, where that offense clearly dropped off in production this year from a year ago under Jim Chaney. Yeah, or they could just hire Bobo as the quarterback's coach and, and something else, potentially. Yeah, but they, they would still have to have a staff opening to I, I think he's going to land somewhere in this league, though, it sounds like. It feels like he's going to land. He might not, but it feels like there's a good chance yeah, I mean, he, he should. I mean, he's a, I, he clearly did not work at Colorado State, but the offense wasn't the problem. I mean, they were scoring a million points the last couple of years, even with third-string quarterbacks. And when he was at Georgia, they had a really good offense as well. So. Well, Sunday's going to be interesting because bowl stuff's going to come out. Is it Florida for Tennessee? Is it the Music City Bowl? Which, as we had in the War Room, Tennessee's in play there for sure. Yeah, I mean, I had it in the – I kind of broke that down earlier in the week. You know, it's – it's the, 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 the college football playoff deal did not help out – those rankings did not help out Tennessee. Well, and I, early in the week I thought it was going to be Tampa or Jacksonville, but I'm not – AP, it doesn't sound like it's necessarily a slam dunk – to Jacksonville if it's not Tampa. Nashville's trying to push hard. Na- Nashville's pushing extremely hard. I think that's that, that's very much in play. So uh, that could be that could be and, Tennessee and like Louisville. Tennessee Louisville or Tennessee Virginia Tech. If right. that's it, likely Louisville, possibly Virginia Tech. And then if it is the Tax Slayer Bowl, that's likely Tennessee Indiana. Indiana. Yeah. The Tax Slayer Bowl does have some interest they in like Kentucky, Kentucky Indiana. Indiana, a little basketball in the grass. Mm. So something to keep an eye on there. That's gonna come out Sunday and then all these coaching changes are gonna start to take shape Sunday and Monday as well. All right, that's going to do it for this mailbag edition of the VolQuest.com podcast. For Austin Price, Jesse Simonton, and Rob Lewis, I'm Brent Hubs. Thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend, everybody.